And the nice thing about teaching the Iranians is that they don't come from a Christian country. They don't come along with ideas from other churches. So one of the doctrines we don't have to worry about is the Trinity. Instead of teaching what the Bible doesn't say, we can concentrate on what it does say, which is what I would like to do this afternoon when we're thinking about the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. So one thing we ought to mention is the terminology. Um, if you're reading from the King James Bible, it'll use the phrase Holy Ghost. But any modern version will always say Holy Spirit. And this is simply because the translation of the Bible authorised by King James I was published in 1611. And English language has changed quite a bit since then. The word ghost is from the Old English word ghast. And uh, it simply means a spirit. So we will begin at the very start of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So here we're meeting God the creator. And the word spirit found here is translated from the Hebrew word ruach, which means breath or wind. Now, interestingly, when I was talking to our Iranian friends, I had a translator that was translated into Farsi. And the word in Farsi for spirit is ruach. So that saved a lot of problems. <laughs> but from this, we have this image of a dark and shapeless world covered in water and the spirit or breath of God hovering over the waters, ready to bring life to this empty world. It also gives us the idea that God's power, his spirit, is an integral part of him, like breathing. And if you continue reading this chapter, you would find that God speaks and what he says happens. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. And this is a psalm by King David. And in these verses, we see how God knows everything about us, including what we're thinking and what we're going to say next. And a few verses later in this psalm, David says, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. So there's no escaping from God. Through his spirit, he is everywhere. He is omnipotent, knowing everything. And through his spirit, he is everywhere. From Isaiah, I will tell of the kindness of the Lord, the deeds for which he is to be praised, according to all the Lord has done for us. Yes, the many good things he has done for Israel, according to his compassion and many kindnesses. He said, surely they are my people, children who will be true to me. And so he became their saviour. In all their distress, he too was distressed, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and mercy, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. So the Old Testament tells us that when Israel left Egypt and travelled through the wilderness on their journeys to the Promised Land, God led them with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And here the prophet Isaiah tells us that this was the angel of God's presence that protected and cared for Israel. So turning to the New Testament, we find the Apostle Paul in Athens. In the city, he has seen an altar that's inscribed to the unknown God. And he explains to the people who that God is. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth. 
and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. God doesn't need us, says Paul. And he doesn't need us to build him a temple to live in. In fact, the reverse is true. We need him. He is the creator of all things and through his power sustains life. And if we have any doubts about that last part, he repeats it a few verses later. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. So not only is God the creator, but by his power, the Holy Spirit, he sustains life. For in him we live and move and have our being. So just an explanation. We looked at ruach in Hebrew, it was breath or wind. And in Greek, it's pneuma, which is breath or wind. And we know the, the word pneumatic in English, which means something that is filled with air. So our next quote, Peter says, Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So that's from 2 Peter chapter 1. And Peter is saying quite clearly that the prophecy in the scriptures was not made up by men, but the prophets were humans who were carried along, or as other versions put it, moved by the Holy Spirit. And Paul, in his letter to Timothy, also conf confirms this. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So we believe that all of the Holy Scriptures, the Bible, was inspired or God-breathed. And as Paul says, it's useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting and for training in righteousness. So let's turn our attention to the, to the Gospels. Right. God breathed in Greek, theoneustos, which means inspired. Now you can see the theo, which is God, and the new, pneumatic, new, which means breath. So it gives you God breathed, and we know that as being inspired. So turning our attention to the Gospels. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. I'm jumping down a few verses. And as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up as the water. And at that moment, heaven was opened and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. So when Jesus was baptised, as he came up out of the water, he received the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, which descended like a dove. And if we read the Gospels, we know that Jesus was able to perform miracles, healing the sick, producing food and drink, calming the weather, and even, even raising the dead. Speaking of which, by his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. It is the power of God, the Holy Spirit, that raised Jesus from the dead. And if we choose to accept the gospel message, will raise us from the dead in God's coming kingdom. So the book of Acts 
begins like this. It says, in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. And the writer, Luke, told his reader, in this case, Theophilus, that Jesus taught his disciples through the Holy Spirit. And in the next chapter, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a, a sound, like the blowing of a violent wind, came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in, in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So this is the account of the disciples receiving the Holy Spirit. And there are a few things about this that we should note. The first is that they didn't have the power of the Holy Spirit in the same way that Jesus did. Because after Jesus was baptised and received the Holy Spirit, he was driven into the wilderness and spent 40 days wrestling with himself, overcoming his desire to misuse the Holy Spirit. Because of he was the Son of God, he was able to resist this temptation. And this is not a problem any of the first century Christians had. Had they faced this type, kind of temptation, inevitably some of them would have given into it. But there is no record of it ever having been abused. So while Jesus had the power of the Holy Spirit, the disciples only had the gift of the Holy Spirit. So rather than them using it, the Holy Spirit worked through them. And although everyone in the early church appears to have had the Holy Spirit, it didn't actually alter their behaviour. There are numerous records of people in the New Testament getting things very wrong and all sorts of disagreements and misbehaviour. It also seems as if this gift was passed on by the laying on of hands, but only the apostles could do this, despite on occasion others wanting this ability. Obviously, there are references we could look at, but it is the Bible hour, not the Bible fortnight, so I'm skipping quite quickly through. <laughs> of course, if only the apostles could pass on the Holy Spirit by the laying on of hands, the ability to pass on this gift would have died with them. And the purpose of the Spirit gift seems to have been to ensure that the New Testament was written. And once this was accomplished, it seems to have faded. So to summarise, the Holy Spirit is the power of God, an integral part of him, like, like our voice or our breath is part of us. His power is a creative force. Through it, everything came into being and everything is kept going. It is everywhere. And through it, God know, knows everything even our thoughts, before we know them ourselves. Like breath or wind, it cannot be seen, but its effects can definitely be observed. And the Holy Scriptures were written by men who were inspired by the Holy Spirit, so we can trust that the Bible is God's word. Through God's power, Jesus was raised from the dead, and if we accept the gospel message, we can be too. So the Spirit of God should be working in our lives through us and through our prayers. God has chosen who he will call, and he does this obviously by his Spirit. And we are told that the Spirit of God should live, live in us. And we didn't have a reading at the beginning of this talk. Instead, we're going to have one now at the end of the talk. And it's Romans chapter 8, verses 6 to 14. Romans 8, starting at verse 6. The mind of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, 
but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give you life to your, Lord, your mortal bodies through his Spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation. But it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the Spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the Spirit of Sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. <laughs> 